This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. Yeah, I think my parents are the biggest influence because um, although they never were in a, a famous band, my mum was a, like a singer, my dad's a drummer, and they used to just do gigs. They were like semi-professional, went around the country doing gigs. Um, and my dad kept the drum kit in the living room like throughout my whole childhood. There's like a huge drum kit in the living room. And there was always instruments and keyboards and microphones lying around. And so... I got a strange mix of music as a kid. My dad is a lot older than my mum. So my dad's era is all rock and roll um, and blues. And my mum was like eighties eurythmics kind of music. So between the two of them, it's given me a really weird taste in music. Um, but I, I think that's where the passion has come from. And then I suppose like a lot of kids, I do remember like taping the chart show and trying to do my own radio show and stopping and starting the, the tape when someone started talking. Um, and I had a, my own little radio show called Radio Radical. <laughs> and, and I mean, obviously you start, how, how did you start? Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure I know, but for my listeners who don't, um, how did you start your kind of career in, in, in show business as, as it were? Well, the quick story is that I was, um, I didn't have a clue how to do it really. And I was living in the middle of nowhere in the, in the East Midlands in a tiny village and uh, I just, uh, I was going to go to drama school. That failed. Um, I just didn't audition for enough schools. And so I just literally Googled how to be a TV presenter. And weirdly, at the time, there was a website called startingtv.com. And I just put my profile on there and did audition after audition and, you know, got little jobs here and there and thought, oh, maybe I'm all right at this, but wasn't paying the bills. So I was working in a shop at the time. And then... Um, it was one of those weird moments where I got an, uh, to ask to come down to London to be in an advert and it was like 175 quid for the whole day. That was so much money to me because I, I wouldn't have earned anywhere near that in the shops. I was like, amazing. So I went down to London and did this. It was just for New Magazine and it was only one word parts. Like I'd come on and say Peter Andre or diets and it was chopped up into an advert that was like, what's in New Magazine this week? And then all of us would pop up going, it's, you know, celebrity gossip like this. So you'd never think anything would come from that. And yet that is how I got spotted by the bosses of Channel 5. And within two weeks of doing that advert, I got asked to be their weather girl. And then that was my in to telly. I mean, is it normally like such, such an in? Um, because you, you've gone so quickly uh to, to the you know what is i mean in my mind at least like the pinnacle of, of of radio you know hosting the capital breakfast show that's like the legendary slot like that everybody everybody wants uh but so so when when you were um uh, you know doing the weather broadcasts some some of those went like completely viral didn't they it was like it was not your you didn't make this opportunity you know you didn't just do well at this opportunity you really like seized it and and you know Tell me a bit about that. Like what actually happened and, and how did that lead, lead on to um, the amazing things that you've done in such a short time? I mean, it's really inspiring. Oh, oh thank you so much. Um, I think it's just because my passion was comedy and, you know, there was part of me that wanted to be an actress and I, you know, I really wanted to be doing comedy sketches and here I was doing the weather and it was so controlled. I only had 40 seconds to speak. I could only speak about what, you know, what was going on behind me on the weather map. And so it was so restricting. You know, I was probably desperate to be, I think, you know, it was way before podcast, but, you know, I was desperate to be chatty and, and, and whatever. So I had to just do what I could do. And the only thing I could do, and I started doing it just to make the camera crew laugh and the, and the gallery crew, was just do dares. And it started with funny hand movements and then it, you know, it, it changed to something else. And then eventually it became 
Dare Sean on a Friday, um, which then turned into a Twitter game because that was just kicking off. And I just got anyone who was like watching me, following me to give me a word to sneak in. And then on the <laughs> lunchtime bulletin, I would do it. And like my bosses didn't have a clue and I was probably really not supposed to do anything like that, but I just started <laughs> doing it. And then kind of from there, I took it too far as always and ended up with like 23 Star Wars puns in a 40 second broadcast. There was more joke <laughs> than weather, but luckily that is like, that was the moment. Like I think everyone has those little eureka moments in their career where they don't know why it worked, but it did. And that just got the attention of the right people I needed. Yeah. And did so presumably at a certain point, you know, your bosses uh, realized what you were doing. Did, did they mind? And uh, was there a point where you felt like, God, I'm being a bit kind of brave here. Like, did you worry about losing the kind of opportunity that you had? Or, or, or did you think that they'd be pretty understanding and, and see, you know, the humor and stuff? Yeah, I remember the day it was, so this 40 second broadcast that I did, I used to have to pre-record it because the studio um, had to quickly swap to do the news. So I had to do my weather in the corner. And so I'd only record it, I'm talking 10 minutes before going live, but I'd have this short window where I'd record my weather and then the news crew would come in. And I wanted to do this, this weather with all these puns in and I only had one shot to do it. And I was getting everybody in the office to just give me more references of Star Wars. And then as soon as I heard a word that I thought would work as a forecast, I was putting it in and I recorded two. So I did a totally straight laced one. And then I did this Star Wars one. And I w on, normally I didn't say anything to the top bosses, but I went to the editor of Channel 5 News and said, look, I've done something a bit silly here and you have got an option to play the straight one, but I do have a really silly Star Wars weather forecast. And it was, um, it was something like 20 years since the last movie. So, that, so it was big news, luckily. And so the stars aligned, they were going big with Star Wars on the news anyway. And the bosses, we all got on and stuff. And, and I just saw this like glint, um, it, it was called Ben in his eye and he just went, go on do the other one um, and, and the crew were allowed to play out the, the mad one. <laughs> but I mean, that that's, yeah, because it, it feels like broadcast uh, journalism, I guess that kind of explains the popularity of podcasts. It feels like broadcast journalism can be quite restrictive uh, sometimes, but it's despite everybody saying, oh, podcasts are amazing, like it is still what most people watch. It's, it is still what most people listen to and, and that must be part of um why you've become so popular and and, and risen so quickly because you're you, you know you're bringing something fresh and, and and different uh to formats which can be you know i mean weather broadcasts as you say you know that is a pretty restrictive <laughs> medium uh, so so it's amazing that you were able to be creative with it so how did you make the transition into into radio uh because of course before capital you were on heart um, you know, presenting your own huge radio show. Uh, so, uh, yeah, how did you make that transition? Genuinely, I'll never know for sure. I really do think it came off these puns, these the, because it was like a mad thing. I tweeted the video, got a few replies and retweets, but then the next day my phone was going mad and it was like, I didn't, I was like, what is going on? And then I was seeing headlines with my name in it and it wasn't just a, uh, the UK, it was America, it was Australia. I, I was getting called up to be on different radio shows at that time. And then, um, and previous to this, by the way, I had wanted to get in radio and I'd done a demo for Heart two years before. So I was still doing the weather. Heart probably just, I was roughly on their radar. We've heard about this, Sean. I came in and did a demo. And at the time they went, we just can't quite place you. You sound a bit too young for heart. There's nothing on capital and like, but we're going to keep your, your, your file. We're going to keep your demo on file and we'll get back to you. Um, and then nothing. This is what life is like. I got nothing for two years. So this is why I always say to people, don't ever get down about stuff because I believe that everybody has a time and a place that it's supposed to come together. And uh, that could have seemed like it was a goner. 
So yeah. anyway, in the meantime, all these different radio shows and TV shows are getting me on to do funny chats and Capital Radio, their breakfast show at the time with Dave Berry, they started getting me to do pun challenges for them and they'd call me up and go, Sean, do a Harry Potter one and can you do this one? And those videos did really well uh, on the Capital Social. And it was when, again, social media was such a new thing and people going, oh, maybe there's something in this. This is getting a lot of traction. And I think because those videos did well, I think it brought my name up again to the global bosses who were the, you know, the big radio station, global. And it was a strange one because despite all this crazy phenomenon with all these puns, my contract was actually coming up. I'd been there for six years and they were changing who supplied the weather and the Met Office had just lost the BBC contract. So they came for Channel 5 and went, we'll do your weather, uh, we'll do it all in house and provide the presenters. So suddenly I was out of a job and I got told mm -hmm. that my contract was not gonna be renewed. And I thought, I can't believe this. And then that very same afternoon, so in the morning, I got told I, I was fired, essentially. In the afternoon, I get a call from a producer at Harp who said, hey, Sean, you know, you did that demo two years ago. The boss wants to see you. And then that was the start of me doing the Heart Evening Show. So it's just mad. Wow. Wow. That's, that's like going, uh, you know, straight in at, at, at the deep end uh, to, to radio. And how, how did you... Uh, adapt i mean i'm assuming that you found you you took to it uh i mean you can see that you took to it naturally but you, did you have to like prep loads did you have to kind of oh. overthink it or did you just go in and, and and you know be yourself no tom let me tell you it is the hardest thing i've ever done you know, I did telly, I thought, you know, I was good at memorizing and I, I was good with auto cue and all this stuff. And I thought, oh, this will be all right. And it was so alien and, and it undid everything. I had to relearn to be a good presenter. When you're on radio, because it's so intimate and there's just the microphone, you realize that you're shouting, you realize that you put, the second you hear your voice in headphones, you start doing this, good morning. It's hard <laughs> radio and you start putting, you're like, where's this voice coming from? But I tell you, <laughs> anybody does it, you can't, you can't help it. And you sound, so you, you're sounding too, you're too loud, you're nervous, so you're talking really fast. And at the same time, yeah. it reminded me of learning to drive because you know, when you first learn to drive, you're a bit like, don't talk to me, I'm changing gear and a mirror signal and nothing's natural. In TV, you've got the PA counting down the timing in your ear. You've got the auto cue written for you. If you want to ad lib a bit, that's easy. You, you know, it's all going to be stopped and started for you. You've got somebody on the floor doing this. You've got the production. When you're on radio, it is like you are every member of the team because your hands are, the right hand is, is bringing up the music. The left hand's bringing up your microphone. You're looking at the counter on the top to see how long you've got left to talk. And at the same time, you're trying to be natural and not think about anything and just sound really relaxed. And I was, I don't know if I can swear on here, but I was absolutely you breaking can. it. Like, oh, it was, yeah, I was shitting it. I was shitting <laughs> it. It was so difficult. And I honestly had breakdowns where I thought, I'm normally so quick at picking stuff up. And I was like, maybe this is just too hard. It, and because I knew the responsibility of being on this network show, and so I would, my show was at 7 p.m. I swear to you, I, st I used to come in at one o'clock in the afternoon and just prep. I used to oh. think, what am I going to talk about for three hours? Yeah. Oh, it was so hard, honestly, at the beginning, so hard. Yeah, that's so, I didn't realize that about, uh, you know, the controls and stuff. Why is that? Why, why, why are you in control of like fading in the music and stuff? Is that just because it, it makes it Not, actually easier for you to talk and, and, and interject? Yeah. So as much as it feels like, why am I having to learn so much? It's the best way. Again, like learning to drive. Once you've got it, you've got music on, you're chatting to your mate, you've got one hand on the steering wheel and you've got like a, a you know, McFlurry in the other hand and you're chilled. And that is like radio. Once it all clicks, because you've got control, you learn to take your time and then you learn to use the music to like do the punchline for the joke. And then 
you realize that if you turn the music up here and just stop talking for a minute, it gets someone's attention. And then you learn the craft of it really. Mm. You, obviously there's certain shows where people wouldn't drive the desk themselves. Um, but for my evening show, although it was the hardest start and it was such an uphill learning curve, once I cracked it, I was like, oh, I get it now. And I see, just wait a minute and then press this and then fire this. But I made so many mistakes at the start. Um, genuinely, one of my, because the thing as well is you're not doing that all the way through the show. So at Global, once you've like done your links, you tap a button that's called the automation button and then everything just auto plays. So it's like putting a playlist on Spotify, right? And then mm. it just goes next song, next song, next song. And all you have to do is when you're ready to talk and control it, you have to take it out of automation and then start your bit. And then you're in control again. And I think you only ever do it once, but there's a really important junction where it's the top of the hour is where you're doing a few things at once because it's the news. And because we were a network show, the news is split to all the local stations. So once you've press the news button it's a pre-recorded bulletin that's all different across the country so once it goes out you can't really stop it without completely cutting everything off and going to silence and I had left it in automation so or it was ready to play the next thing but then I was manually pressing the buttons and so everything played at once <laughs> and what ended up happening <laughs> was a news bulletin going out and I'm not kidding it was like <laughs> and 30 people die in a car crash. And at the same time in the background, I've got Pharrell Williams playing, cause <laughs> I'm happy to do, 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 do. And I was like, ah, and I couldn't stop it. So I had, you know, Pharrell playing under a serious news bulletin and, and, and everything was going at once. But you, you live and learn and, and you learn the hard way. And yeah, it was, it was, it was the hardest thing ever, I think. Did, did they, I mean, presumably the bosses were, were very understanding of that. And in terms of going in every day, actually, like, because you have to prep different things to talk about uh, and, and think of different things to talk about. Do you ever feel like it's restrictive? I mean, people are making, everybody's making a podcast now, you know, I'm ashamed to say every, it feels like there's some crazy statistics saying that 40% of the population are going to have podcasts by, you know, like the next five, 10 years or something like that. I mean, who's going to have the time to listen to all of these? Uh, and in a podcast, you can ramble on as I'm doing. There's no restriction at all, uh, which makes, you know, proper kind of old school broadcast presenting. It's more of an art form, it's, but it's also more restrictive. Um, do you find yourself thinking of things to present and uh, or things to say and thinking, oh, no, I couldn't possibly do that? And to what extent do you have to, you know, run things by the powers that be? Yeah, so many good questions there, right? Because a bit like when you're doing your podcast, you, you know, you are, unless you have a guest on, you are essentially just chatting away to yourself. And so the first thing when I did radio was realizing that I really struggled to tell a story really well without eye contact. I used to sort of pride myself in being a good storyteller, but you realize that you're waiting, are they enjoying it? Do I milk it a bit more? Are they tell, you know, their eyes saying wrap it up and so you get to the punchline quicker. And I had yeah. no gauge of how long to talk to get these stories out. And the best way I can sort of describe it on radio, it's like when Twitter only had 104 characters, you learn how to be funny in such a short, tiny little box in such a restricted place. And yeah. I think it does refine how you, you realize that there is a quicker way of telling a story. And of course, at the beginning, the only way I could do that was to myself prep what content I was gonna do and then write it out so I knew it was roughly a minute. And then from there, try and learn to come off the scripts and trust my own instinct with the timing and get better at being just natural about it. But yeah, at the beginning, it was like, it was very restrictive. And I don't know how easy it is to describe this, but on heart, there wasn't just what we call a bed of music. So there wasn't just endless music. And then we call it an outstab where you stab, this is hard. Instead, it was a package piece of audio that you'd have to choose and it could be 23 seconds and you have to drag it in, or it could be 47 seconds. So the problem with that was 
before you got familiar with that, that way of talking, you started getting into the flow of your story and you, you look up and go, oh God, there's 10 seconds left of this ramp. And then it's going to say, this is hot, whether I finished or not. <laughs> and sometimes I would start rattling away at the end of the story, try and get the punchline in and then it'd go, this is hot. And I'd go, oh, oh. and it was, all, you know, I ruined it. So that must be yeah, terrifying when you've kind terrifying. of only got like halfway through something. When you're in normal kind of social interactions and stuff, because of the fact that you've learned to be, you know, very effective at communication, you know, you can get to the point in a minute, you don't ramble on. Uh, and when I listen back to old podcasts, I realize how bad I am at this sometimes. And everybody is when you're having a normal no, chat with not. someone, but when, when you're in the pub and you've got someone, or, you know, in normal times anyway, uh, and someone's just going on and on and on, do you sometimes think, God, you really need to do the same kind of training that I've done, like get to the point. Uh, or are you more tolerant? Than that? I think <laughs> I've always been impatient. I'm always at a hundred miles an hour, and yeah, I'm uh, sometimes with my mum. I'm, I'm sort of tapping my feet. Like, Come on, where's the where's the end of this story? We've gone off on ten tangents here. You know, <laughs> my dad's a guilty of it as well. He starts on one topic, and by the end of the story, I have to go. So, did you get the hat or what? Because now he's talking about salmon or swans, <laughs> and I'm like, what? Yeah. So I think they, they do teach you so much at, at heart. And I have to say that it really was like um, uh, like a boot camp in how to, uh, you know, like have, they always say to us, have one thought per link. So try not to go off on too many tangents because people just can't follow that. So, and obviously don't get me wrong at the beginning, you do, because you don't really know how to do that. But um, I got really good at like, as well taking my time and not trying to cram every story I knew in life into the whole show and every single, you know, some links need to be shorter than others. And sometimes you just need to tease what you're going to say next and just get people's attention and then come back to it. Um, and yeah, we, I think I got trained quite well to like get the point across, get that punchline out. And the other thing was because of those ramps with the this is hot, I had to learn not to try in it. I was trying to hit that vocal to say my punchline and then that come on. And yeah. it was so difficult because of the timing that I learned to put a slightly longer ramp in, do my punchline, sort of take a breath and then go, right, it's quarter past eight, coming up next, it's uh, Ollie Murs. And, and then, you, then you get, this is hot and then you haven't rushed. And they were all things that I just had to learn and you learn the hard way. And I'm sure I will cringe if I heard my <laughs> first few shows on heart, they'll be awful. That's yeah. It's really interesting. It must be quite a satisfying moment as well. When you're just like, you've just like nailed it just before the, this is heart thing comes in or yeah. I, 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 it's a bit like a kind of rock star moment uh, with, with radio when those things come in. Like that would be a good, a good moment to sit in the, in the radio hot seat, I, I'm imagining. So you wanted to highlight uh, the favorite artist that you've ever met. And am I right in saying you would have met him on heart, uh, Ed Sheeran? Why is he your favorite yes. artist that you've met? I think because he was my, uh, you know, like, like everything, thrown in the deep end. I reckon I'd started the show and I'd been there it might have even been a week or two weeks in and they were like, right, you're interviewing Ed Sheeran. You've got half an hour with him. And this never normally wow. happens in radio. You normally get, I'm talking seven minutes. It's like precise. They'll go, right, you've got seven minutes with this artist. And by the time they've sat down, going, you, you, you run out of time. Yeah. But this was important because he just, he just brought out the Divide album and it was this big wow. deal. And he had all the time in the world to promote it. Um, so I had, half an hour with Ed Sheeran, just me and him, he, you know, he's straight opposite you. And I was so nervous and he was just great. And I, he made me relax and I felt like we were chatting, you know, as friends. And then weirdly, because of this album doing so well and Hart were playing it all the time, he then came in about six months later. And I'll never know whether someone told him this or not, but it felt so genuine. He walked in and went, Sean, oh, how are you getting on? I bet you're doing better since the first first time you met me. Like, I was your first interview, and he, he remembered all that, and he was going, how are you getting on at heart? Um, 
and I'd had a joke with him about Lego last time he came in. And I said, um, oh, last time you came in, Ed, I, it, and this was for the interview. So I sort of was repeating it and saying, oh, last time you came in, I gave you this little Lego figure that, of yourself. And he went, oh, I know, I've still got it. He said, yours is one of the only pieces of Lego I've kept. He's like, I've got that. I've got, um, I think he had something like the Fal uh, Millennium Falcon, that, and something else big that he'd spent himself. And you know what? It doesn't matter if it wasn't true. It was a fact he remembered and he, he was such a gent and so fun. Mm. And after that, I, I, just, I just hit it off and just liked him. I thought, I want to go for beers with this guy. Like, I want him to be my best mate. And we just... Um, it just was nice. And then we did a few other gigs and then I would, I, we did a whole live gig where I got to sort of host it and be backstage and, and ask him, I think because I felt like at this point we had a bit of a rapport, I felt comfortable to ask him cheeky questions and, and to sort of push for slightly, you know, more angles about his private life or whatever. And, and it was, it's just really nice. So he stands out because he was the first guy I interviewed and yet he's, probably the person I've interviewed the most as well. Wow, yeah, and he's so, you know, he's the biggest, probably the biggest artist of like this century, as, as it were, like in, in pop terms, for sure. He's the biggest thing since the 90s, since Oasis, or I, I don't even know, like he's he's huge and he does seem very down to earth. Is So I was trying to find YouTube footage of this because I hadn't, uh, I hadn't seen it, but did you once accompany him on on a kazoo, uh, doing Shape of You? Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that literally was the first interview. I was like, I've just got to, I've got to go with this and hope he joins in because sometimes <laughs> there's no time to double check with somebody if they're okay with it. And the amount of times I've thrown ideas at an artist and actually the longer I did it, we started having to get things approved by management. But in these early days, I'd just go, right. And I said, well, and you've played every single instrument, Ed, you know, you're on the guitar, you, you've got your foot pedal and whatever. And I was like, but have you ever mastered the kazoo? And he was like, no, actually. So we both did Shape of You, but Shape of Kazoo. And had like, and he just joined in and was so fun about it. Like he didn't, he didn't just look at me and go, what are you doing? He started doing it. And then the irony was that both, both of us played it wrong. I don't, how we played a kazoo wrong, but we both had it in the wrong end. <laughs> so actually the noise wasn't even, it was just us kind of humming through a tube, like going, I'm in love with the shoot, like this. Shape <laughs> of you. <laughs> it, we weren't even playing the kazoo because we got it wrong, both of us. And so in, in the end, that's what any, everyone commented on on the video was like, don't think you're playing that right, either of you. <laughs> But that's su that's su such a kind of testament to him, though, like not being someone who takes himself too seriously, because like, but probably loads of people, you wouldn't be able to just kind of do that with, and they'd be game, and they'd be funny, and they'd be yeah, just no. down to earth. And uh, and I mean, it's a testament to, as well to how great a guy he is. If because that divide album was what sent him from like massive to sort of you know superstar like all time kind of hall of fame you know that was such a huge I remember record. Him saying, yeah he said that it was shape of you that made him beyonce famous so i remember him describing it as because he was famous like you say and, and we all loved him in this country but that one was like the catapult i think that made him global yeah yeah i mean he could feel he feels stadiums by himself all over the world i mean yeah what what, what amazing experience to, uh, to develop a rapport with such a great artist now there there was uh something that's been kind of going on for a while and uh and is yeah really uh, a kind of big talking point at the moment is the free britney movement and you said that the first single that you ever bought was hit me baby one more time so uh you know, what do you make of the free bit Britney movement? And, you know, do you still like that record as much uh, as you did, I'm imagining, uh, when you bought it, bought the single? Yeah, there's certain songs in your life that you that you remember because it's like, it represents even just like a feeling and a moment. And Britney coming out with this baby one more time, even now, if I hear the bum, 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 it's like, oh, there we go. Like if I heard that <laughs> in a club, it would still affect me. Because it's yeah. just such a, it was just such a moment. 
I feel like it was either 98 or 99. I was in year eight at school. I'd bought, I think I even bought it on tape and CD. I, you know, I just, and we all were Britney mad. And she was like this, she was squeaky clean and like total role model. So like, you know, I suppose like Little Mix are now to, to teenage girls or, you know, people like that. And, but I was young, so I was a fan of hers, but I didn't grow up with stuff like MTV. So I never knew anything about her other than she was cool. And I like her songs, I like her outfits. I want to learn the dance moves. So now I'm an adult and I'm going back over all those things that maybe I did catch in the press. And, you know, even mm. like that umbrella moment where she'd shaved her head off and she's got an umbrella, you know, at the time that was seen as a joke. And there was, I'm, I feel like I might have even had a mug that said, you know, if Britney can survive 2007, I can achieve anything. You know, it's that kind <laughs> of stuff. Yeah. And then you look, you watch this documentary and you're kind of like, oh, we, we failed Britney. Like she was totally, I suppose, stuck in this horrible mechanic and this machine of press versus contracts and then show business. And it's quite scary really that you think, um, like a lot of celebs, you get built up to the point of being an absolute god. And then at that point, unfortunately, the only way is down. And a lot of the time the papers and, and media can't wait to tear those people down. And I do feel for Britney because I think when you look at the documentary, she was just absolutely bombarded every second of the day. Like I, she had no private life, but at the same time, you know, was trying to be a happy performer. And, you know, in some respects you can relate when you, I've had days where I felt so sad and had to go, and I've like almost been crying minutes before I've gone on air and had to sort of suck it up and go, right, showtime, crack on. And I can't imagine doing that at Britney's level. So she was obviously having so much going off in a private life with her kids and marriage falling apart and she was emotional. So then being hounded by press, even when you're at a petrol station, you sort of as an adult go, I get it. Of course you're gonna lose it. Yeah, yeah, you've got to have sympathy for her. And it's very confusing though, because I do remember, and it's like you say, I'm sure I caught it in the press, but it's not like I was following every word of of what happened back in 2007 when she was experiencing some mental health issues. But since then, she's been doing residencies in Vegas. And I was sort of like a little bit confused uh, when I saw that she, she had been doing huge tours and residencies in Vegas and all this stuff. I was a bit confused. Like I thought she was under conservative, what was it, conservative ship or something? Conservatorship, yeah. It's, I think that's like an American word, isn't it? But yeah. it's like, I think it's almost like in, in our country, we'd say like power of attorney where you've got, you can speak on someone's behalf and yeah. you can make decisions on their behalf. But the extreme of it for Britney and the length of time it's been going on feels unnecessary. I'm, really I'm obviously we don't know all the ins and outs, you know what I mean? Like, and, and maybe, maybe at that time when she was at her lowest, she just did need someone to sort the finances and all the business so she could focus. But I, you can't help but feel like that situation has then been exploited, perhaps. I mean, we don't know all the facts, but it just seems to be, I think she's in a better place now. And I don't think every inch of her life should be this controlled because she's clearly not happy about it. Yeah, for sure. And apparently it's from what I was reading about it anyway, it's not, you know, it's not just like the finances and managing of her career. It's sort of like, if she wants to go out, leave the house and spend some money, she's got to get some permission. I mean, this is crazy. This is one of the biggest yeah. pop stars in the world. I mean, it's, and, and I'm sure it was like a voluntary thing. And I think Brittany herself has said that it was voluntary and she still wants to be under this type of management and to have a gradual easing of it. But uh, yeah, it seems really excessive now at this point. So do, have you seen the documentary? Yeah, and I was quite shocked and felt sad. You know, my experience of Britney was just this fun, you know, life-loving person who I just saw as a pop star. And I think feeling like, oh, wow, this is, this is actually what was going on at the time. You sort of go, oh my God, I have no idea. And 
I don't know whether you follow her on Instagram, but you can tell that something's not right. That the her behavior on Instagram is is when you when you see how she used to do interviews and how how quick witted she was and sharp and smart and in control of all her shows, in control of who was hired and who did what. She feels like a very different Britney now. Um, and I, I don't know, I find it interesting that I think fans picked up on it and it's it's mad now that, that massively respected publications like a New York Times are finally going, wait a minute, maybe there's something in this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it will probably Man. it will probably get resolved in a year, maybe, from what I've read. But it's still quite a long time. Um, it seems like a complete mess, the whole thing now. Yeah. So I, yeah, it's it's yeah. such a strange situation. I reckon a load of new like dolls. That. Yeah, and I think if it's proven that this has been a manipulated situation, I think it will probably change a lot of laws in the US around that conservatorship thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, this probably has been, it's not been the case to such an extent uh, where it's, you know, she's given, revoked all of her kind of legal rights. But it does feel like pop stars historically have had this kind of vulnerability about them. Uh, and I don't know whether you, whether you find that sometimes when you get super famous people um, who, who you're interviewing and then they're just right there and it's like, wait a minute, you know, you're, you're like a human being as well. Because when I've seen people like uh, few, on a few occasions and met people and they're just right there, it's just like, it's so weird, you know, when, when they're just almost totally normal or if not that, just even vulnerable. Yeah, and I sometimes think it's not always the artist themselves. You know, like people that get like diva reputation or, oh, that person's difficult to interview, or that person, oh, it's a nightmare trying to get them to approve anything. Half the time, I think it is the people around them. You know, the bigger you, star you are, the more staff you have and crew and people around you, and everyone's managing every single thing. And I think with some artists, it goes too far. And at the beginning, it's probably quite nice. Again, it's like the Britney thing. It's quite nice everyone's taking charge of all your stuff. You don't have to think about it. But the scary thing is these people do represent you and sometimes they're the first people we speak to as you know broadcasters or whatever so we might mm. have an opinion of an artist and actually really it's not them that were difficult maybe they have no idea but it almost feels sometimes like if there's so many people on on the team that everyone's trying to make sure they have, they said their bit because they did their mm. job and so it's a too many cooks situation where it's the whole uh, what is it? Plead for forgiveness. Don't ask for permission. Because almost if we say if we're trying to do a big idea on the radio show, if it's like if you throw it out to a big artist who has a massive team and say, what do you think about this idea? If they all just went, yeah, cool. They would look like they weren't doing their job. So it's almost mm. like, you know, they're going to come back and rip that one to shreds. So sometimes it has to be like a tactic of going, we're going to, send them a ridiculous idea and then hope that the second idea, which is actually the real one we want to do, is the one that they go, <laughs> oh, we'll do that one instead. Yeah. But you pretend that that's the one you didn't want to do, but actually that was always the one. That's a very smart tactic. Uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like a king's court uh, or a queen's court, you know, uh, in, in the sense of people just don't want to get out of favor and they want to keep retain their positions. Um, but someone who you can't really imagine having a, a big kind of team and a, a, and a diva reputation in many ways is Eminem. I mean, you said that Slim Shady LP uh, is like your whole childhood. I mean, me too. Uh, and uh, the Eminem show and the Marshall Mathers LP and, and uh, those early records were yeah. so good. Um, yeah. Uh, do, do, you still, do you still like Eminem? Has Eminem been on, on uh, one of your radio shows? No, and I think it would be a, sometimes there's little moments in your life where you think, would I be starstruck? And I think maybe I would, because I don't know what it was like for you when you first heard his records, but we were like, I remember, I think it was 98 um, when The Real Slim Shady came out. And I was like, again, I was in year seven at school. And it was like the coolest thing I'd ever heard. I'd never heard somebody um, 
with that voice and that sound and then the beats were always amazing which obviously later you find out is all produced by Dr Dre and then you realize that you it got me into rap I think I, mm. I was a kid that didn't really have rap on my radar and then I was like whoa what's this and I was obsessed with with everything about it with the lyrics with the um with the beats with the sound um and yeah and I remember like we were so young and he had so many names. We didn't know, we were calling him Slim Sadie and we didn't know how to say it. <laughs> you know, like, and yeah. then it was like, is he Eminem? Is he Slim Sadie? Who's Marshall? And, and you know, is that this, you never know, kind of, I don't yeah, know. He was just such quite a, young. a mystical person. And yeah, yeah. We were quite young to kind of understand like alter egos and stuff. I mean, some of the content in his thing, in, in, in the albums as well, is like quite shocking. But it was like, whoa, this guy is so like, I don't know, he was so rebellious. He was like what punk must have represented back in the day, but so much more than that. I mean, I guess was hip hop wasn't played like, or probably wasn't played enough back in the 90s, like on radio, whereas now it's so, you know, it's probably the biggest pop genre, right? Yeah, and I think sometimes it's like, people forget that actually, I don't know how old you are, Tom, but like my 30. era, like I'm a 30, 33, 30. Yeah. Mm. 30. Okay. Yeah. So like when you're in your 30s, you grew up with hip hop, actually, because of Eminem and then Dr. Mm. Dre and then Snoop Dogg. And then it, it was like, it's interesting, actually, when you think about when people say to me, like, who, what kind of music did you like? Really, it was all them. It was Missy Elliott. It was Eve. It was actually a lot of R&B and hip hop sort of combined because they were, the that suddenly just took off. And that sort of sound was so like big when we were growing up. And I think that is something that I do still enjoy. Like, um, I think you'll always have an era that you love in music. And I just, I fell in love with that sort of hip hop sound. And I do every now and then, like I will listen to stuff like that. But I think as I've got older, I've gone a bit more mellow with it and gone like Anderson Pack and mm. uh, like Kendrick Lamar and stuff like that. I like that kind of music, but um, yeah, I think obviously it's evolved and Eminem in a way, because he was quite corny and, and like some of his stuff was almost aimed at a kid's sense of humor. I think it yeah. had its time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's not, he, he's still, I'm sure, making great, great songs and, and, and records, but it's like that initial, you know, everybody has their golden era. And that was, it was kind of so shocking at the time. Uh, you mentioned Anderson Pack, and uh, it was actually through Anderson Pack that I discovered Mac Miller. And you said you discovered Mac Miller's stuff too late. Um, how, how did you discover it? I mean, both of these guys have collaborated, they're such great artists, but yeah, Mac Miller, um, very tragic loss. Yeah, um, I went to LA on holiday and I kept seeing this poster of a lad like sitting in a white room with a pink suit on and he was everywhere. I kept thinking, who is this Mac Miller? And then I sort of maybe Googled him and was like, oh, and I re like referred to him as, oh, it's Ariana Grande's boyfriend. <laughs> and like, I didn't know anything about him. Didn't know anything about him and I'll be honest, didn't even sort of venture into his music at that point. I just was aware of him. Then, like you say, he tragically died. And then you start going, oh, it's that guy that I kept, and you know, I felt like a bit like, oh my God. And I found myself in a wormhole of YouTube videos going, um, think it like, just, just sort of discovering him. And then, you know, on YouTube, those Tiny Desk concerts. Have you seen those? Yeah, I saw his one. So amazing. And Tiny Desk is it's like the yeah. best idea ever. <laughs> yeah, so if you haven't seen it, it's just literally like, um, it's just a little office, isn't it? Where it's like, a, I think it's actually a radio station where they just start getting mm -hmm. artists to just go in the office in a tiny little corner and perform live. And that's the one I saw. I saw the Mac Miller one. And when, wait, this is that guy. How did I never listen to his music? And I realized it was so up my street and I loved it. And then I got well into him. And then I felt such sadness that I would never get to see him live. Mm, yeah, cause he really, uh, I mean, that's the thing with the Tiny Desk concerts because it's in the corner of a little office. 
it's so exposed. There's none of the production, um, you know, additions that you might get in a big arena show. So they've got nowhere to hide and Mac Miller just absolutely nailed it. But there are so many um, on that Tiny Desk series uh, where you're like, how are they going to do this? Like the, the, I don't know if you've seen the T-Pain one. Obviously T-Pain's so famous for using auto-tune and he turns up on the Tiny Desk thing and oh, yes. he's just like, I, I, I bet you guys are wondering what I'm going to do with no auto-tune. Then just opens his mouth and he's literally sort of like, as good at singing as Marvin Gaye or someone like that. He's just so soulful and like, yeah, just nails it. <laughs> wow. I'm going to look for that one because I've watched quite a few. If you haven't seen this one, one to recommend is the Macklemore one. Have you watched that? I haven't. I need to watch that. That one is so good. And the only thing that would have made it better would have if he had proper live backing. I think he was probably one of the early ones where he didn't really bring a crew with him. But there's a few like backing singers, but there's no live music. Um, oh, right, yeah. But his, his voice, and honestly, it made me think, God, he's underrated as well. He's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it, it really does that with so many. And it's, it's so cool to kind of have them in that setting because it's just like they've turned up to a pub or something. Because when you go and see an arena show, you wonder, you know, how much tuning is going on and how much, uh, how much are they kind of cheating as it were. But there's, yeah, that's such a cool series. Um, how has lockdown and this, uh, you know, era been for you? You mentioned that uh, you were listening a lot to Disclosure's album, uh, Energy, and that was helping getting you through. But how, how have you um, adapted to, you know, what's been a, a really weird last, I mean, I guess it's been nearly a year now. Yeah, we're coming up to a year, which is madness. Um, I honestly think, like, thank God that music kept coming out. Like, I feel like maybe we don't even realise how much we've taken that for granted. Like, remember, like, TV shows ran out of episodes. EastEnders, I think, basically stopped. This is not, you know, all these things ground to a halt, and yet music kept getting produced. And I felt really, I thought, this is actually amazing that we're getting this one little joy in our you know very basic lives right now that we're getting blessed with new music and I found for me it was house music that got me through a lot of lockdown and I just started trying to recreate that sort of club bar vibe in my own kitchen you know and just learned I learned to do stuff like I've learned to make so many good cocktails I've got all the right gear and the shakers and whatever and um and I've definitely like embraced playing games more and um, getting the Uno out and all that kind of stuff. And you know, a bit like when you play a song on repeat on holiday, and it becomes the holiday song. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I've got songs now that I've really relied on, particularly from that Disclosure album. There's some really, really, um, really good ones. Um, and there's one called Tondo and there's one called it's in brackets because I don't know what the real title is, but it's the one that goes Mali, Mali. But those two are like the songs that are like proper. They will always remind me, I think, of this, of this 2020, 2021 era of lockdown. And in a way, it's not a bad memory. Like, yes, of course, it's been horrendous and it's been frustrating and it's been very sad. But I think a lot of us feel guilty to say we've maybe enjoyed parts of it because obviously... It's been so sad for a lot of reasons, but I think there have definitely been some things that we've taken from it that have been positive. And I think enjoying simpler, simpler pleasures and just being comfortable in your own company and, and not relying on a lot of other things. I think it's been a quite a big lesson for a lot of us. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think anyone should have any, you know, guilt as it were about saying that they've enjoyed elements of it. I think it's actually a very good reflection uh, on, on someone, you know, if, if you can have found some pleasure in it, because it's so easy to feel frustrated. I mean, the Energy album is great. There are so many great collaborations on it. Channel Trays, A Slow Thigh, uh, Kalani, I mean, you name it. I mean, a great, great comeback. I mean, not really a comeback, but a great follow-up from Disclosure, because, uh, you know, it's quite difficult to follow up the kind of success that they had been having, because they, I don't know how long it had been since their last record couple of years yeah it had been a while I, I think I even remember going what's happened to Disclosure because I've yeah. liked them since I, I think Latch was when I first became aware of them or you know with Sam Smith but yeah. um 
I, and I really, you know, I love house music. I find that that's maybe the genre that I sway towards maybe the most nowadays, um, especially that kind of vocal house where it's, you know, a very chilled vibe. And um, we talked about Tiny Desk, but I also, I don't know if you're aware of um, the videos Circle, spelled C-E-R-C-L-E. Have you seen those? No, I, I need to check them You'll out. You'll like them, I reckon. If you like, yeah. And what I do is, what's cool about them is it's DJs in ridiculous places performing. So, like in the middle of an iceberg. And uh, Disclosure yeah. do that whole album um, at the top of a, a like a, a mountain on looking like a jungle. And so I put it on the telly and have the music with the visuals as well. So you sort of feel like you are somewhere else. And that's a bit of a lockdown hack while we're still stuck in lockdown. That if you've got a bit sick of, of telly, most smart TVs now you can whack YouTube on or you can do some sort of Google Chrome thing or whatever. Mm. Um, uh, but, you know, or your fire stick. I would just recommend getting DJ sets on or whatever artist you love and just have them playing live on the telly, even if it's in the background, because it definitely is something that I've enjoyed. And I think with these, those videos, they're good because they're so aspirational because they are literally in a beautiful setting. Yeah, they, they sound like they're, they're a great way of kind of escaping uh, for a bit. Uh, yeah. But of course, we've had... Uh, some some good news with uh, you know June the twenty first being the sort of fingers crossed date. Uh, is there a live gig that you're looking forward to going to if the gigs do indeed return, or an artist that you'd like to see? Yeah, I think there are so many actually. I, I really I've really got into the weekend since his most recent album, and. Then I watched his Super Bowl performance and thought, he is an artist I have to make sure I see. Like, I, he just seems, like, I was just so amazed and I love the new album. Um, mm. And so probably him as far as like a big artist. I mean, actually, I feel like I just didn't go to enough gigs and that is my goal. I think like a lot of people, I wanna just go and see loads of live music. I've missed it. Um, I would love to try and see Disclosure and love to see them in like a sunny beach setting, Ibiza or, you know, just, I want to be in the sunshine with a drink on the beach and some house music playing. And I, I can't wait to do something like that. I can't wait. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.